Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back from the break. I hope you, I trust you've all had an enjoyable uh, morning and uh, start to the afternoon so far. Lots of interesting presentations and discussion. Um, and so I hope we can continue that with the final session of the day here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. We certainly uh, I and the companies, we all certainly appreciate your interest in the space. It's obviously a dynamic, fun time to be engaged um, in metals and mining and, of course, precious metals in particular. So without further ado, I will jump right into my presentation. Of course, um, as has been the case all day, if you have any questions for myself or for any of the presenters during the session, please enter them into the question box over on the side, and those all get um, pulled together, and I can um, address them to the appropriate uh, answerer during our Q&A session at the end of this session. So um, a golden setup and what to do about it. I really think we are in the early stages of a pretty fun, um, intense gold market. And so I just wanted to capture where we are today, why I think things are unfolding the way that they are right now, and um, and what, what I'm doing to uh, position to take advantage of it. So um, pardon my French here, but honestly, what are stocks doing? The really common question I get, I get pulled into this conversation on a daily basis with people wondering, and I mean this is a broadly discussed topic um, in the financial markets, what are stocks doing and why are they doing it? There has been an unreal rebound in the market, um, fueled, of course, by the Federal Reserve action, central banks around the world, of course, but led by the Fed, and what I'm calling an unprecedented investment landscape. The landscape is just different than it's ever been, and that is a huge factor in how this rebound is developing. When I say led by the Fed, I mean the Fed is backstopping everything. And equities are soaring as a result. They're not directly buying equities, but they're even buying junk bond ETFs for crying out loud. I mean, they're protecting zombie companies. Zombie companies, by definition, are companies that don't make enough money to even pay interest on their debt. They are, by definition, um, not financially viable but the Fed is buying their corporate bonds. So they're truly, by doing that, they're simply saying, we're not going to let anyone fail. We're not going to be, we're not going to let COVID cause the failure of anything, even things that arguably should fail. And so you can see that zombie companies are now outperforming the index on the Russell 2000. So that shows you that people are just jumping into the opportunity created by the Fed. Now, since it's an opportunity created by the Fed, what we've been left with is what I call the great disconnect. The stock market doesn't have a lot to do with what's going on in the economy. Instead, the stock market is being driven by don't fight the Fed and this really ingrained mentality by the dip. Investors have bought the dip and done well with it for 10 years of this bull market. So if it's worked and the same systems are in place, but even bigger, why would you do anything different? You're going to buy the dip. There's also, when I say this unprecedented investment landscape, it's really important to realize that there's nowhere else to go. Huge funds can't just sit in cash because of uncertainty, and they used to pile their money into bonds, but bond yields are terrible, so you can play bonds for price, but that's a different game, and it's certainly a game that, that has to be played. But even before COVID, stocks were increasingly the place for these large pools of low-risk money. Now they're almost the only place. Like I say, they certainly still buy bonds, but nowhere near to the same degree that they did 10 years ago. Um, and so the nowhere else to go factor is important. There's this immense Fed support for everything. And then there's also the fact that the markets, the stock markets really just showcase big business. They don't showcase small business, which are the ones that are going to be disproportionately affected by COVID. In bottom line, I think investors are largely ignoring reality. There's this concept that the March crash accounted for all the terrible data that is to come. So traders are now moving on what stocks should be worth once it's all over. Doesn't make a lot of sense given all of the uncertainty, but it's what's happening. So it's speaking of uncertainty, this all works until it doesn't. And what will make it not work? I think you can categorize the threats in two pools right now. One of them is COVID 2.0. And that I'm capturing everything from a second wave of infection and whatever that might result in, lockdown, things like that, to simply a grinding realization that persistent weak spending can't justify valuations this high. Consumer spending is so important. I mean, the entire G7 economies are really about consumer spending, and that is 
there are huge question marks around consumer spending right now. Of course, this colorful chart on the bottom is about how COVID has played out. The big question is whether there's going to be a second bulge in there of any form, and if so, where it really ramps up. The other aspect of works until it doesn't is U.S.-China trade war. Now, this was really starting to peak its head up until George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter um, movement dominated headlines, as it should. Uh, and so we haven't been hearing about it as much in recent weeks. But this is really significant. Remember what the trade war did to the stock market in 2018? Beca and it did that because it really matters. This isn't just about investment flows all those screwing with Hong Kong as a portal through which to invest in China is a really big deal. It's also about the fact that U.S.-China trade is deeply ingrained in how a huge number of companies operate, especially on the tech side. And so the, uh, a trade war screws with all of that. So these two other shoe threats that I think are hanging over everything, they are pushing investors to gold, no matter what's going on with the stock market. This little table here shows the top gainers um, year to date from ETF.com. And so you can see that, yes, people are putting money into the S&P, but they're also piling money into gold. The next few slides are about how this is a gold bull market. So we've I think it's easy for us to hesitate because we've been waiting a long time for this to truly happen. But we now have the fundamentals almost perfectly aligned, the most important of which is certainly negative real rates. At the last Federal Reserve Open Market Committee meeting, long name, the people who set rates, um, the chair said twice, we are not even thinking about raising rates. The dot plot says the same thing. Two of the members of the committee thought maybe they would raise rates in a year. Everyone else sees no change until the end of 2021. And so the point is we are in a negative real rate environment. It is here to stay for the for the next little while, and that matters. We can see what happened to gold as soon as that decision was made. This I kind of like. So I've got the one month, two months, six months, one year, two year, five year charts of gold, and I just put that because if you just look at the one month chart, even the two month chart, there's nothing particularly convincing about those as a gold bull market, but you got to take a step back, right? The six-month chart starts to look pretty convincing. The one-year chart looks fantastic, and on we go. We are in a gold bull market. It took a long time to get started, but COVID ended up being accelerant fuel on the fire, and that's because of the negative real rate transition, and that is truly the situation right now. Another um, piece of evidence that I point to a lot these days in terms of this being a gold bull market is that the financing world is in a frenzy. And I'm talking about gold companies, gold and silver companies in particular. I mean, we're seeing literally overnight multi-million dollar financings for early stage explorers. We're seeing larger companies regularly upsize their finance things by 20, 30 percent, and there's no warrants attached to these. These are basically market deals, but demand is through the roof. We see new companies, whether it's initial offerings or reverse trends, um, reverse takeovers, we, we're seeing these deals jump as soon as they start trading, and I think that's largely because investors who wanted to get into the financing couldn't. Um, and if you talk to junior explorers, everybody is fielding calls from brokers who want to raise the money. The demand is there, um, and so that means that there, that just reinforces this idea that there's a lot of investment demand for um, junior explorers, and that matters because the more money that's out there that gets raised, the more work that gets done, the more discoveries that can happen, and discoveries create excitement, which draws in more money. This is how gold bull markets establish their momentum. It's also really key, I've been talking for years, that what this gold market needs is generalist money. They were starting to get interested before COVID for a whole host of reasons, but now they're definitely here. The GDX did not make that move um, out of the COVID crash just because dedicated gold investors bought Newmont and Barrick and the big, big deals. It made that move because funds, generalist funds, moved into the gold space. They did so because gold bottoms first. They did so because gold miners stand out across equities 
for balance sheet strength and earnings strength. And this is because they went through a bunch of hard years. And so relative to a lot of the market that does not have, excuse me, great financials, miners, gold miners look really good. That's what this chart on the side here um, is trying to demonstrate is how gold miners have a rising earnings per share trend which is very different than the average earnings per share trend for stocks on the S&P. And the important takeaway here, one of them, is that it takes a long time for generalist money to move into a space. So inflows, the inflows that have happened in the last few months are just the start. They will continue for a long time. And generalist money moves in largely on a more investment perspective, not on a trading perspective. It's not the funds that are putting tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into the sector are not trading that based on gold losing a percent because there was a good jobs report out of the states. They're there because they believe in the gold thesis and they're using the gold thesis as a hedge for everything else. Again, this matters because it's a big part of building gold market momentum. So what about the US dollar? Um, this could be a talk in itself, most certainly. I um, am fairly confident that we're looking ahead to a strong U.S. dollar, um, and I think that that is uh, – the COVID situation has reinforced that. Um, COVID has created – has um, increased um, global demand for the U.S. dollar to the point that there's a shortage at this point. Um, and within that global demand – or that global demand happens because – there's no alternative to the U.S. dollar payment system sort of on a global trade basis. While there are increasingly non-U.S. bilateral trade deals, the U.S. still dominates global trade, and U.S. dollar-denominated debts abound. These things all mean that U.S. dollars are the liquid, are the, are the oil that keeps the machine moving, right? People say, but the Fed's printing so much money. Won't that weaken the dollar? Every central bank is printing money, but the difference is that there's demand for the money that the Fed's printing. I'm not saying that this all works out in the long run, but in the medium term, what we have is a huge amount of demand for the dollar and everybody printing, so that factor matters less. And I also just think that the U.S. has the deepest, most liquid capital markets. There's this currency strength argument. You put them together, the U.S. markets are going to outperform the rest of the world, and that's going to create a cycle of up pressure on the dollar. And then... Americans are not unaware of all of the things that I just said. I definitely think that the U.S. is going to use this as a weapon to a certain extent, certainly as a tool in its foreign policy um, book. And so it can control the availability of things like swap lines, um, and that's going to be a factor going forward for sure. So bottom line, I really do think that we're looking ahead to a strong dollar. But that does not, to me, impede the gold argument. Gold can absolutely rise alongside the dollar, and I think the two things that really matter here is, first of all, yes, we usually talk about gold in U.S. dollars, but investors can get around that by investing gold miners that are producing gold in Canada where, or in almost any other country where the gold price in the local currency, in Canadian dollars, in U.S. dollars, and the list goes on, is at all-time highs already. So there's a huge amount of benefit that can happen from sort of flipping the dollar argument um, and taking advantage of currency weakness in a lot of countries that produce a lot of gold. So investors can get around it in that sense. And then there's the broad argument that the U.S. dollar competes as a safe haven. It absolutely does. But that fundamentally assumes that holding dollars returns you yield, which is not the case right now. You don't get yield for holding dollars. That is likely to only be cemented because we had yield curve control ahead. It hasn't been guaranteed by the Fed, but certainly they're talking about it enough that I would guess we have yield curve control ahead, which just means that the Fed is going to keep long-term rates down farther for longer. So that's more no yield. So it just changes the role, um, the roles that these two um, competitors play in the safe haven space. And I think the outcome increases interest in gold. So the point is, yes, the dollar is going to be strong, but I don't think that that um, anywhere near invalidates the gold argument. 
Okay, uh, just to wrap up here, um, how to play, again, could be a talk all on its own. I could spend an hour speaking to this. Um, it really depends on your, uh, the two things that I always say is it depends on your risk tolerance, but almost more importantly, or almost the same but said from a different angle is how much time do you have to pay attention? How much time do you want to dedicate to your portfolio? Because the more risky the stocks in your portfolio, the more singular pieces of news matter, and therefore the more you have to pay attention to those stocks and what's happening with them. If you don't want to pay a huge amount of, if you don't want to dedicate a huge amount of time to tracking your portfolio, then don't choose explorers because um, whether it's a huge gain that eases or whether it's a huge loss because of bad results, you need to pay attention to those stocks. So amongst this list, that I think really determines which area is most appropriate for each investor. But I'll just say that majors have certainly done well in the last few months. They will keep rising. This is the generalist dollar argument. Big money requires big liquidity, big market caps, and defined metrics. There just aren't that many places in the gold space that multi-multi-billion dollar funds can put money because of their scale requirements, their liquidity requirements. So the big miners will keep rising. Um, when you're looking at developers and advanced assets, the thing there is that they offer defined value. They offer tangible assets. Generalists really like tangible assets. They don't have to be huge, but they have to have numbers around them. They have to perhaps have a sight line to production, at least have some metrics that demonstrate that this thing could make money. That gives generalists who are not experts in the gold space some confidence that it's a real thing that they're buying. So again, as this market evolves, developers and advanced assets um, start to perform more and more because they fit that requirement. The optionality play is a really good one as well. Um, the argument here is that the value that the market gives per ounce in the ground really rises as a gold bull market develops, and so big ounce counts really work. If you want to start into that trade today, what you should do is look for assets that are not yet looking great that will look pretty darn good once gold is 100 or $200 more because that transition from not economic to economic is what can give you the biggest um, uplift in a share price. And then broadly speaking, I want to comment that for the last five years, I've really only considered the absolute best of the best. Uh, that was the Capital was so limited in its availability in this space that only the very best of the best could access the cash to move their projects ahead, and therefore they were the only ones that um, I was willing to invest in. Now the list has broadened. There's a lot more capital available. There's a lot more generalists who have different um, ideas of what they want in the space, and so look at the best of the rest. In general, you want real projects being driven by good data and ideas with technical expertise in-house. You need clear plans. You need management that can raise money and tell a good story. You want to avoid obvious overhangs like ballooning, balloons of warrants or debts or bad partnerships or social permitting situations. And I'd say you want something in the story that has the potential to generate um, to attract attention, I say a splashy angle. Maybe it's great, maybe it's scale, maybe it's um, uh, unexplored fit, um, package that was locked up and never accessed before. Maybe it's self-funding. You know, there's all kinds of things that can make a story stand out, but I would say you want something there that is a little splashy. And I've just put these four share price charts here because these are four very different companies. An early stage silver explorer in outcrop, a um, resource expansion gold story in Mexico with Prime. Troilus is a large-scale Quebec gold project with a bunch of infrastructure, and of course, Pure Gold is on its way to producing its first gold in Ontario. Uh, there's a real range of grades here, of commodities, jurisdictions, scale, stage, but they've all done super well in the last little while, and that's because a lot of different kinds of stories can do well in a bull market. So just make sure that you broaden your perspective. 
I finished with 10 whole seconds to go. So uh, these are the letters that I write. Absolutely feel free to ask me for more information about any of them. If you um, have any interest, there is an opportunity to subscribe for a discount for being uh, part of this forum here today.